Good morning. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming in on such a short notice. But uh, we had this word tickle into IFI from an anonymous source from the Ministry of Environment, uh, whose name starts with Berj Hajian. <laughs> and he told us that there is a very distinguished person in Lebanon who might be of interest uh, whose experiences might be of interest for, uh, for us as a community. So we, we, he dropped the name, we took the name and we Googled it. Oof. We thought, nah, there's somebody that's really uh, worth having over. And we got a number and uh, they said, try your luck. So I picked up the phone and I talked to Her Excellency and she said, yes, I'll talk. Yvonne, please. Okay. <laughs> and she said, yes, no, no worries. When do you want me to, to speak? And I thought, oh, shit, you know, that's uh, too soon. <laughs> when, you know? So we panicked inside, and we called and said, is Friday good? Yes, Friday is very good. I'll call you on Monday, and we'll arrange things. And here we are. So uh, for those that don't know, I will go through the official uh, introduction. And it's a mix of what we could collect. I'm sure I'm going, not, I'm going to do a disservice by not talking about everything, a lot. But I will go over it slowly and try to cover all that I have. I've got lots of papers. I'll not read them all, though, but I'm taking them out. So, that. so uh, we are lucky to have amongst us uh, Her Excellency Yvonne Abdel Bayi. Uh, I'm going to use the, not a baki, the a baki, the Abdel Yes. <laughs> We're in Lebanon. Yeah, I'm Abdel Baki in Lebanon, yes. Uh, she's a diplomat, a politician, a peace negotiator, a humanist, and an artist. So she doesn't belong to our times. I think she belongs to previous times where Plato and Aristotle used to be around and where people were big. Uh, here it says she was born in Guayaquil. In Ecuador, in Ecuador. Ecuador, of Lebanese parents. And she was instrumental in helping Ecuador and Peru reach a peace agreement in October 1998. Uh, she was Minister of Trade, Foreign Trade from 2003 to 2005. She helped advance regional integration projects in Latin America. And as an Ecuadorian uh, an ambassador to the United States, she extended the Indian trade preferences and helped fight uh, the, the fight against drug trafficking in the Western Hemisphere. She also served as, uh, the, as Ecuador's honorary consul in general in Lebanon. And I will speak now a little bit about her political background because I don't think that's, you know, that I'm going to distill it. In 2002, she became candidate for the president of Ecuador and she ran on a social justice platform trying to bridge the gap and shrink it between the rich and the poor uh, through education and sustainable development. As we said earlier, in 2003, she became ambassador, uh, sorry, Ecuador's Minister of Foreign Trade, Industry, Regional Integration, Fisheries, and Competitiveness. And she launched many programs designed to increase the value added of Ecuadorian uh, products. In 2006, she ran and won the elections for the Indian Parliament, and in 2007, she was elected president of the Indian parliament unanimously uh, with a vote from five countries, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. In, uh, after the oil spill in the Galapagos Islands, Her Excellency created the Galapagos Conservancy Foundation, which has been key in the protection of the environment. In 2010, she was named by Ecuador's president, Rafael Correa, to lead the Yasuni ITT negotiations to protect the Amazon's most biodiverse area in all of South America. In 2012, uh, she was named Secretary of State for the Yasuni Initiative. Uh, Yvonne Abdelbae holds a master's degree in public administration from Harvard. She is also a recognized painter who has spent the period 1990 to 1998 as artist in resident residence at Harvard. She was recently designated as a UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador recognized for her commitment to projects aimed at strengthening dialogue between cultures. Uh, we are really very fortunate that to have 
somebody of her caliber amongst us, and I really thank you for taking time from your very busy, busy schedule to share with us your experiences. I hand over the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Nadim. It's a pleasure for me to be here, and thank you, Baj, also for helping arrange together with Nadim this event. I am, I am, I'm really so pleased because, as you know. It's true I was born in Ecuador, but I feel very Lebanese. I feel very much attached to this amazing, wonderful country that I wished it was more peaceful. And I wish we could all be here and my children and my grandchildren also be here with me. My son is here with me today, Faisal. And he's the one that brought me back to Ecuador when we went to the United States, when we left Lebanon. I left Lebanon in 1987 because of the war. Uh, we were here all through the war. My children were born in Lebanon. So anyway, for me, this country is very special. I have my sister who is here too, who stayed here all the time. But it's so good to see so many familiar faces and so many people that I have been with and been seeing around and so many of you that are here today. That, um, that's why when Nadim asked me, I said, of course I will. No matter what I have, I would love very much to come back. And I haven't been in the campus of AUB since 27 years. It's the first time I come to Lebanon after 27 years to stay for a little while. I used to come political official visits for one day, two days, but this is the first time I stay a little longer. So it's, I want to say something that I was saying at him. Um, the project Yasuni that we're going to speak about today, it's, it was very much into my heart. You can't believe this place what it is. It's a unique place in the world. It's in the Amazon of Ecuador but it's unique for what it is. And I haven't spoken about it since a year. And I didn't want to talk about it anymore because it was stopped. They are going to take the oil underground. It had to be done. Uh, and I will explain the reasons afterwards. But let me tell you the story of what it is and why this place is so unique and why we were fighting so hard to keep it. Not for Ecuador, it was a gift of Ecuador to the world. You know, Ecuador is a small country. Of course, it's bigger than, <laughs> than Lebanon, but the Yasuni project, the Yasuni, it's the size of Lebanon, 10,000 square kilometers, 10,500 square kilometers. Um, but Ecuador is a very peaceful country. It's a very unique country that believes in people and believes in the environment. And always it has been having protected areas. But when the president of Ecuador, the new president, President Rafael Correa, came into office in 2007, the decision was to keep this place untouched. And it was done in a very unique way of how it was done. It was done in a way that um, it's true that we need the money because it's a developing country that needs for education, for health, for infrastructure, you name it. But we believe first and foremost in the people. And Climate change is an issue, and we're hearing all the time that what's going to regulate climate change is the Amazon. And as, as you know, the Amazon of Brazil, Colombia, Peru, including Ecuador, it's where the oil is. So they are taking it. So they're cutting the, 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 the forest. So we decided that this place, Yasuni, which is unique, and you will see a small video that will know why. And then we'll talk about that, why it is so unique and why it had to be kept. If you can start with the video first, please. Yasuni National Park, located in the Ecuadorian Amazon rainforest, is an exceptionally unique biodiversity refuge. One hectare in Yasuni contains more species of trees and bushes than all of North America. Two isolated indigenous tribes, the Tagaeri and Taromenane, inhabit, together with the Huaurani, the Yasuni National Park. <laughs> Yasuni ITT, an initiative to change history.
Ecuador has proposed to the world an innovative plan in order to confront the challenge posed by climate change to the future of mankind. Ecuador proposes to leave beneath the Yasuní National Park the 846 million barrels of oil that are within the ITT block. By doing so, the emission into the atmosphere of 407 million metric tons of carbon that would have been released by the burning of those fossil fuels are avoided. In exchange, Ecuador requests that the international community assume its corresponsibility by contributing no less than half of the revenues that would be received by selling these oil reserves. Direct benefits of this initiative. The non-emission into the atmosphere of 407 million tons of CO2 and the guaranteed non-exploitation of these petroleum reserves. The conservation of the immense biological richness within the Yasuni National Park declared by UNESCO as a biosphere reserve along with the conservation of 39 additional national parks adding up to the most biologically diverse reserve on the planet. Respect for the cultures of the indigenous tribes who live in isolation within the boundaries of the Yasuni National Park. Reforestation of a million hectares. A decisive impulse to the country's transition from an extractive economy based on petroleum exploitation towards a more sustainable development model with broad use of renewable energy sources, respect for biodiversity and increased social equity. The Yasuni ITT Fund, the CGY's Certificates of Guarantee Yasuni ITT. The Certificate of Guarantee Yasuni ITT will become a financial instrument issued to the initiative's contributors and donors by the Ecuadorian state. It will serve as a guarantee that all the oil reserves that are now underground will remain there permanently. It is a non-interest accruing instrument with no maturity date, given its permanent nature. It could only be redeemed if the Ecuadorian government were to order the exploitation of oil within the ITT fields. All income generated by the international sales of the CGYs will be deposited in an international trust fund managed by the United Nations Development Programme. What investments will be made with the Yasuni ITT Fund? Effective conservation and preventive deforestation of 40 protected areas of Ecuador. Reforestation, forestation, natural regeneration and effective management of 1 million hectares of forests. The expansion of the actual renewable energy generation in Ecuador taking advantage of its enormous resource potential in hydroelectric, geothermal and solar power. Improved social development of areas of influence of the Yasuni ITT initiative projects. Who is supporting the Yasuni ITT project? The Yasuni ITT fund will receive donations from different sources, contributions of countries from all over the world and international cooperation, responsible corporations concerned with the future of mankind, philanthropists worried about the possible consequences of climate change, small donors and global citizens who would access our website. to change history. The petroleum stays there, underground, forever. Covered by this unique biodiversity, protected by the Tagaeri and Tarumenane, by their ancestral rights. <laughs> by nature's harmony. Yasuni ITT.
So, <laughs> so the question that everybody, wherever I spoke about it, they will ask, but why? Why, if the whole of Amazon is so unique, why is it that this place specifically has never been touched by climate change? And the, the reason is because of its position. The Yasuni, this million hectares, is just in the intersection of the Andes Mountains and the equatorial line. And because of being in that specific strategic intersection, it's a little higher than the rest of the Amazon. So when there was the last ice age, 12,000 years ago, the whole Amazon became a savanna, except the Yasuni. This place stayed intact, and all the animals from the rest of the Amazon came to the Yasuni. That's why we have prehistoric animals in the Yasuni. And we have trees that have never been touched because it never was affected by climate change. We have, as you saw, two indigenous communities in voluntary isolation. They are the Waranis, the Tagaeris, and Taromenanis that live there. And they are, you cannot know they are. They are, they are, they are around the area, but they live there. So this place is really unique. And that's why when the president of Ecuador took office, he made this presentation about what to do as an initiative to Yasuni ITT. The ITT is means Ispingo Tambococha Tiputini. It's the fields, the oil fields that are underground. That are uh, that's why you see ITT. It's Ispingo Tambococha Tiputini. Those are the ones that are not going to be touched because we have oil all over. But 20% of the oil of Ecuador is underneath the Yasuni. So when he presented the initiative as an idea at that time in 2007 during the General Assembly in the United Nations, it was during the Clinton Global Initiative, he got a standing ovation because he said, the world talks a lot about we have to do something. We have to reduce the emissions. We have to do something. And, and he said, I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to do it, but Ecuador is going to put a lot, but we still need a part of it. At that time, the amounts of money that they were counting around the 1 billion, 1 billion um, uh, barrels of oil underground was, they were saying around $10 billion for it. Now it's by far much more. Now there, there, there is more oil that was found and the, the amount is over 20 billion. But at that time he said, I'm ready to forego. And I will ask from this, this, the, 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 the community of the world, 3.6 billion in the next 12 years at that time as an idea. So we had to work, they had to work. I was not involved yet at that time. Um, in 2010 is when I entered and he asked me if I could be the chief negotiator for that. Uh, at that time, Faisal was with me too. And, uh, and I, he, he told me, don't answer yet before you go and visit the place. I didn't visit, I hadn't known the place yet, how it is. So we went for a visit to the Yasuni and I fell in love with this place. It's so unique. It's one thing to see it, in a video or read about it, it's another thing to feel it when you are there. I remember that I felt that I believed in creation, I believe in God, I believe in things that I haven't believed after living war in Lebanon and, and, and seeing how in religion we killed each other, that I didn't want to believe in anything. And when you go there, you believe really that there is a creator, there is something beyond that we have to really feel. And I remember that Faisal at night, he recorded the sounds, and at the next morning when I heard it, I, I, was, I, I thought it was an orchestra, a symphony, a, a classical orchestra. It's a better than, a, than the classical music. I mean, it was amazing. So I told the president, of course, we'll take it, but it was not easy to prepare it. We had to have a fund, and the fund had to be with the United Nations Developing Program uh, Fund so that we can get the money that was going to be um, contributed uh, to the fund. It took almost a year. So by the end of 2010, we just started, started the, the, um, the campaign. And I thought that what is not known, it doesn't exist. So we have to make it known. And it's not easy to make something known like this, especially that climate change is still an issue that it's, it's going on and it's not very clear for many, many, many countries, especially those that haven't signed the Kyoto Agreement. So uh, the first thing that we did is create awareness in Ecuador. So we did a campaign called Together, Juntos por el Yasuni, Together for the Yasuni, of, as Ecuadorians. So it was the year of 2011, a campaign to create 
pride, to have proud in Ecuador that it's the first country that is doing something to fight global warming. It was amazing at the end of that year, in November 2011, we did an event, a televised event, to recollect from the people and to see how they will see it and come. We raised in seven hours on TV and, and, and people coming to the place where we were, by the half a dollar, $50, 50 cents from the children, from the young, especially from the young generation, $2.7 million in seven hours. It was an amazing thing. And the people of Ecuador together, 92% of the population of Ecuador, they wanted this project to, to be successful. So the year 2012 was the campaign of the international campaign. But before we start that, I was connecting very much with different countries and especially with the scientific people. The scientists were signing letters, sending it to everybody for support of the Yasuni, because according to them, it was the Amazon that's going to regulate climate change. And Yasuni is very unique for what it has, that it's so unique because of what it is. And there is something that I would like to put very, this is very short, really. It's Dr. Eric Chivian, who is a, a Nobel Peace Prize winner from Harvard University, who was from the beginning with this the project. Yasuni. And if you can just put it so you can hear what he said has more tree species in two and a half acres than the entire United States and Canada combined. In the United States, a tree called the Pacific yew tree contains a compound called Taxol, which is the best treatment for malignant cancers of the breast, lung, prostate, and ovary of anything on the market. One of those trees in the Yasuni may have an even better treatment for cancer, but we will lose it if we wipe out that incredibly valuable forest. If the Yasuni is destroyed, we may lose those species of amphibians that contain painkillers that are better than any we have and that contain antibiotics that will prevent the crisis of antibiotic resistance which is coming down the pike. If we destroy the Yasuni, it will not just be a tragedy for those species and for the people that live there, it will be a tragedy for all mankind, for human health. We must protect the forest. We must stop burning so many fossil fuels. So you could realize that what we had over the land was by far more important, economically speaking, health-wise speaking, in all the ways than what we have on the, on the ground as oil. That was what the scientists were saying and they, they signed the letter, 350 scientists from all over, they were signing letters to send to, to all the, um, you know, especially the political people in the world to do something for it. So we started the, um, the international campaign, which was not easy. Already we had the trust fund with the United Nations Development Program. Um, and it was a very unique special fund. It was not like the other funds that they have it at the UN, which is, for example, there is a natural disaster like Haiti. Uh, what's happening in, in the middle, in the, in the region, the Arab region, to, for Iraq, for example, the reconstruction of Iraq, the reconstruction of Haiti. No, this was different. This was a fund where you don't say we are donating. We are partners. They even changed the name. United, United Nations Developing Program. It, it was it's the, United, the Partners Program. It was the Partnership Program. You were partnering with countries to for the fund. So it was very successful in a way. Um, the, the success that we had in that respect was mostly in Europe. Countries like Italy, for example, they gave 50 million. It's true that it was a, a, it was a swap exchange of foreign debt that we had <coughs> towards the Yasuni. The debt was forget, forgotten. Then Germany was another of the countries that they gave us 50 million. So we raised around 350 million during those times, but the aim was much more and the needs were much more and the money that came from people, just regular people and sometimes anonymous people was amazing. It went all to the, to the, to the trust fund and we will give a certificate of guarantee over $50,000, whoever gave over $50,000, a certificate of guarantee of return if the oil is taken out. So, what I was mentioning is that the campaign that we were doing was the international campaign. And that campaign was called I Am Yasuni. It's creating a connection with every single individual. 
that is part of the Asuni. That this is not for Ecuador, it's for the world, it's for the young, it's for those that really believe that it, they have to live in a better world, and who are better than the young generation believe that? Because it's, it's, it's for them. I mean, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are literally lived in a world that's contaminated, but now it's impossible in 20 years for our future generations to live in a world that it's, it's uh, completely not livable, if you want to say this way. Anyway, um, the campaign was, was, was successful in those respects. For example, in France, though the government did not give us yet at that moment, there was a group that was created called Viva Yasuni. And it was from the civil society and from the different um, regions of France. All the regions, like 12 regions of France they gave us between 200,000 euros, 300,000 euros, 500,000 euros from the regions, but not from the government. The United States it was the first country I went to see. And the United States as a government, they wanted to do it. Especially in the Senate, they were creating a fund for the, um, um, you know, the, the, the cap, and, cap and trade, they call it. They were creating a fund, and it was specifically what we were doing that would have been an example of what they needed. But it passed in the Congress, the resolution, and it was stuck in the Senate. So it was stopped. But the people of the United States were the number one, if you see the ones that were giving, individual that were given. We had the list of everyone that gave, no matter how small or big amount they was given. We had their names, the place, and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and, and the email of everyone so we can connect back. The second country that was the ones of the people giving, it was Great Britain, <laughs> England. And the government was not yet accepting too as a government, but the people, yes. So the movements of the civil society, of the NGOs, was amazing. The, 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 the idea of, of this campaign, I am Yasuni, it's bringing closer to people, as I said, that we are so interconnected, that though the Amazon is very far away from everyone, but no matter how far away, contamination doesn't have borders, and Amazon is the lungs to the world, and in every respect we are, we are, we are interconnected, whether it's an economic crisis affects us all, whether it's a disease like Ebola, or the avian uh, flu affected us all. So we cannot say now that no, if it's far away, we don't feel it. If we have a neighbor that is not living well next or far away, we are all affected by it. So we have to create the consciousness and awareness that all these problems that are affecting us, wars, terrorism, poverty, diseases, climate change, disasters, it's all affecting everyone. So this campaign was amazing how it happened, and I will show you the small video, but not yet, I mean, just before. I was with Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. He loved this project. I was having a meeting with him, and we were coming down from the meetings in New York, and I saw two young students, that they knew me, there in New York, and they said, we have a project for you. We want to show you something that will hit what you want to do as connecting uh, of, of you know, the problems that I have. And this, and they said, give us just 15 minutes. I was with the, my, my friend, actress Bo Derek. She was an, a good an ambassador to the Yasuni with me. And she told me, Let, it's OK. Let's lose the plane. Let's start. Because we felt that this, these two young people were so passionate about it. So we went and we sat for coffee. We stayed for five hours. And we did. And they did. We, didn't, we accepted that they do the video. And they did it. And this is the video they did. And we were promoting it everywhere. It's called I Am Yasuni. It's in New York, Madison Square Park.
is our clock, right? Yeah. This is our clock. Yeah, we shouldn't be allowing this. That's what I gotta do. That's my job. What the hell is the matter with you? This is not happening. How does it make you feel when they pump oil in the park? I mean, I thought these parks were for the people. I mean, I bring my kids to this park. What about? No, no, no. no. You gotta talk to your representative. What's going on? Yeah. Yeah. Are you kidding me with this? Down. 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 Planning trees. We're not supposed to be digging for oil in this park. But the thing is, they, they put this thing in a public park. Officer, well, this, this is totally unacceptable. You understand now, right? Uh, is there anything we can do about this? They're entitled to. They have a permit. There's nothing we can do. So this really um, shows how, how much the, the people, not only from Ecuador, but everywhere, were so much wanting this to be successful. And I'm, I'm not saying that it was not successful. It was. It was successful. Um, but we couldn't keep it longer. And the reasons, of course, the economic crisis, the um, prices of oil, the needs that Ecuador had for development. We are, we are changing Ecuador in an amazing way with the, the President Correa. He's doing a lot of things for the social development, for housing, for schools, and for infrastructure. And we needed, we needed the money. So it was difficult to take the decision of keeping it longer when we were seeing that there was no reaction for those, from those countries that were supposed to join and they were not joining. So the decision was taken, it was very painful. It was the most painful decision of the president to take it. Uh, still until now, now as we are speaking now, he is, the president is in the Yasuni now, having a cabinet meeting with all the ministers there to evaluate still if we can still do something. Um, his children, they are against it, 100%. They are keeping on pushing on him not to do it. And the young generation of Ecuador is all doing demonstrations in the streets not to do it. They had a poll just recently that 73% of Ecuadorians, even if we don't get a penny out of this, they want to keep the oil underground. 90% um, of the Ecuadorians, they are for it if we continue doing it. But it's still, it's not difficult. It's, di it's difficult. They are going to do it in a very, very um, conscientious environmentally technology uh, safe, it's, but even with that, it's so fragile, this place, that even with the minimum change, it could affect it. The, the two, the tam, Tambococha, Tiputini, the two fields, they are a little outside. So they could do it from horizontal ways, from the river, and take the, take the oil out and take it outside without making pipelines and without creating roads. But the Ispingo, which is in the heart of the Yasuni, it's not going to be touched. And half of the oil of those three fields, it's in the Ispingo. So it seems that they are the, taking the decision of keeping it. So we are working on it still to save if we can. In fact, now in Peru, during the COP uh, that's coming soon, in these coming uh, days, um, there's a lot of talk about the Yasuni and how to do something. We are uniting the countries in the World Economic Forum. We created a group of different countries like Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Ecuador. Uh, to, 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 to save something of the Amazon together. So maybe together we can do it. So we're working very hard on it still. But sadly, we had to stop the campaign that was going so big and it was <coughs> uniting the young generation. And um, it was an example to, to the world of a country that's small but believes in the human being because the planet will continue. What's going to disappear is the human. Things go wrong in the world with climate change. The planet will continue. It's us that are going to disappear. So anyway, I, I, I will stop here. I think, I think it's better if we take questions. Okay. If somebody wants to know more about it. Thank you very much.
Uh, we have microphones roving around, and we would like to start with the questions first. Your Excellency Adil Artas, please start. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really congratulate you for this uh, initiative, which is really uh, very good. Uh, but uh, I have a question for the future. How to ensure that your project is sustainable for the future? Now we have this enthusiasm. The conditions of the Ecuadorian economy will permit you, will help you to do it. And also the generosity coming from outside, from the United States of America, from Europe, etc., will help you to do it. But are you sure that in the future where it will be more pressure on the Ecuadorian economy to do otherwise, to go for the drilling? How, how to make sure about that? No, thank no, I, that's a, thank you, Excellency. No, I mentioned, I mentioned we are not going to continue doing it. We can't. That's what I'm saying. We have stopped the project. They are going to drill in the fields of Ishping, uh, Tambococha Tiputin, so we can. You're absolutely right. It's going to be very difficult to continue having the prices as we have at that time, 100 over plus, and also finding out that there was by far more oil than the billion barrels that we thought there is. So it's not going to continue. What we are trying to, to see if we can keep at least the one that's in the middle of the heart of the Yasunio that will affect not only the, um, the surroundings, but also the two communities that live there in voluntary isolation that are in this part of the heart. So yeah, it's very difficult. But one thing that I didn't mention is that the money that was given um, for the project that we had to return, we had to return to those that gave the money over 50,000. And those that gave it in smaller amounts and they are united and they know how much and we have the names, we will return it back. And we did, we have returned almost everything. But there are many, many, and the majority, they don't want it returned. Like Germany said, no. We want to keep it so you can help the 40 um, protected areas of Ecuador for the environment. To keep it, um, in, in, to use the best technologies to do it the right way. So they kept, they kept the 50 million. Italy, the same thing. They, they wanted to keep it. And so many others, Luxembourg, name it, Australia. There were so many countries that were, uh, in Belgium it was not as a country, but uh, Valonia, the region, gave a lot of money. So th those countries, they are deciding not to take it. Some private companies that were giving, many private, Coca-Cola and others, because they thought that the study of water, you know in Ecuador, other than the intersection that it protects the environment, it is the largest resource of water in the world. And because the president of Coca-Cola, um, Mujan Kent, he's Turkish, and he is very aware of the environment when he came to Coca-Cola. He said, I will not take much water to the, to the Coca-Cola if I don't find a place where I can say I'm, re I'm preserving this and I'm using water. So he was making a study and they put over five million for the studies of how is it that we have so much water and we're going to protect it. So the money they gave and they make a big campaign and they help us in the campaign that we were doing, they are going to keep it. So what I'm saying is that this is not going to continue. The project, that's why I'm sad. The project had to be stopped. Uh, yeah. Back. Um, sorry, I have the mic. Um, my question is, um, why weren't you successful uh, with regional bodies instead of individual countries? Did you approach, for example, the European Union or other regional bodies to adopt this project and to put it on their agenda and, pro and probably enforce it on the country members? rather than, you know, uh, approach Britain directly or uh, individual countries. And the second question I have quick is um, you're focusing too much on oil versus uh, sustainability or environment. Why don't you investigate in a more positive manner, for example, the pharmaceutical benefits of keeping it and even exploring and exploiting it? So did you, did you go into this direction of seeing what benefits you can get from Yasuni rather than just, you know, oil versus preserving it as it is? It's a very good question. I'll start with the last one, yeah. You're right about the issue of the oil. The ground. We were, that's what one of the things that uh, Eric Chivian, Professor Chivian was saying, don't focus on the oil. Focus on the things that are more important. And even if the technology in 10 years will be so unique that you can just not destroy anything and, and also take oil. We were working on that too. 
I mean, it's not that we take, took it out. And in fact, now there is a new university that's next to the Yasuni that is going to be for investigation, for investigation on the scientific level. And from Yale University, there was a, a group of students with the professors that came just a few months ago, and they discovered a, a, a fungus that dissolves plastic. Could you imagine how much money it is that if they put it into practice, and it's going to happen. So the, the, the investigation part and the, on, on the, on the super, on what we have over the land there, it's by far more, and we're seeing to it. But that, that takes time. And in the meantime, they want to take some of the oil, which we're still talking about, that are, is in the region that it's not going to destroy the biodiversity that we are investigating. So it, we're playing two, two, two ways. The other thing that you mentioned about the countries, we, it, was, it was difficult to unite all the countries together to help. That was the aim. We could unite the civil society, the NGOs, the groups, yes. But the countries, let me tell you what the Minister of Economy of Germany told me. He was against it. It was the parliament that fought and obliged the ministry to, to, to give the money. But why? They said, this is a very bad precedent. <laughs> and I said, why, do you th why is a bad precedent? He said, because any other country will come, for example, Saudi Arabia will come and say, I want to keep the oil underground, give me the money but we don't put the CO2. I said, oh, go and visit the Yasuni and see if it's a desert. I mean, they came. We made invitations. We came, we brought the parliamentary groups, especially the Green Party of, Brazil, of Germany. They all came, and from the party of Angela, uh, Angela Merkel, from all the parties, and when they saw what it is, they pushed the government to change. In fact, there was a, a, a cover magazine in, um, it was, I think, the uh, Spiegel, that they put the picture of Dick Nebel, who is the Minister of Economy and Development, they put him with a cask and a machete, how do you call it, a, a, a hammer, cutting the trees of the Yasuni. That obliged him to change. So we tried with the countries, but it was difficult because of that. I went to OPEC, the OPEC countries. We had a meeting in Vienna with everyone, and I said, I need one, one, oil country that unites with us. Venezuela, we didn't. Because they said, if we did it, sorry, if we did it, it means we are accepting that oil contaminates. So it was very difficult. I'm telling you, it was a very, I had the fight of so much. And internally, in Ecuador, it's true that we have the plan A, which was to keep the oil, but there was a plan B that if we don't, fuck, you cannot raise the money, we have the plan B to take the oil. And who was my number one enemy was from Ecuador himself, the people that want to take the oil. So it was a, it's a very difficult thing. I think one of the reasons, and I have to be realistic on that, it's that it was before time. It was ahead of time. I think if it was this project, 10 years from now, it would have been very successful. It's still too new to be accepted. Sadly. Your Excellency, uh, thank you so much for this inspiring talk. It's disappointing to see that the government of powerful countries uh, disappointed and did not really help. I mean, they always talk bit about climate change, but they never walk the talk. Now, our common friend here sent me the, your uh, talk with TEDx, and the first thing I thought is that, how come I didn't know about this? I work in the conservation field and never heard about, I knew about Yasuni, but I had never heard about the initiative. And my second, uh, the second thing I, I, I thought about is that, how can I help? Is it too late? So I guess my first question is that, is it too late? Can we still do something about it? And my second question is, what are the lessons learned from it? How can we still benefit from your experience? Because in Lebanon and in the region, we need to lobby a lot about forest conservation, marine conservation, climate change, and so on. So anything you can share with us from your lesson learned? Thank you. No, really, uh, I, I spoke at TEDx. It was at Harlem TEDx in New York and in Washington. I didn't speak in the TEDx here. In I was, um, as I told you, it's the first time I'm coming and stay a little longer here. But I came to Lebanon for the, pro for the, for the project. I came to Lebanon. I met with the Minister of Environment. At that time, it was in 2012, maybe? Yeah, and uh, there is always the goodwill of, of trying to help, but you know the mistake I did, and I'm telling you the mistake I did in Lebanon, I didn't speak with the students. 
every country I went, the, the best part for me, it was when I went to the universities and the colleges and the students. And, and I'll give you an example. When you just started, I went to a school in Columbia Heights in Washington. Students uh, from the ages of uh, school, from ages of five to 18. And I was talking about it, that we need the support, and that's what we did in Ecuador, about the, how the people were giving a small amounts. You know, at the end of the talk, first of all, they knew about it, because they had read about it, this, the, the, those that were 15 years and so on. At the end, it had raised, they were like three, 400 people. They raised $400, each gave $1. So we started the campaign of the dollar with the students. It was fantastic. So yeah, you're right about it. What can we do still? I, I hope I could, I could. Faisal says that we can still move the people and the, the world to, 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 to start talking. They are. They are moving in, a, in an incredible way. But the thing is that, as I said, internally in Ecuador, we have the other group that doesn't want it to happen. So it's difficult for me, being from Ecuador and representing the government still, to, to, uh, to, to, to go against it. So if I do that, it means I'm working against what they want to do. So it's difficult. Just if you can still talk about the best example to the world for this is was Yasuni, it would be enough. It would be great. It would be great if you can still talk about it because everybody's talking about it still. Why you didn't hear it here? Because in Lebanon, when I came, it was not publicized. I don't know why. Maybe also they don't believe in it. <laughs> when I was in Qatar for the COP, uh, two years ago, was it? Yeah. Two years ago. It was very good. And I met with everybody. Abdallah Al Atiyah, he is Excellency Abdallah Al Atiyah, he was in charge of it. And he's a very good friend of mine. And he told me, Yvonne, I'm ready to give. But what if I give you the 50 million or 100 million, or whatever you want, or more, it means I'm accepting that oil contaminates, and we're still oil countries. So it's, 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 it's very tough. It's very tough. It was very tough. And they were ready to give. When we were at Rio Plus 20, the president of Ecuador, he, we made a panel with the best scientists, politicians, everything. It was the best one in Rio. And Abdallah Atiyah came. He was there because of Qatar. I invited from all the Arab countries just to hear about it. When we finished, he took me aside and he said, it's fantastic. It's great what you were saying. That, that's very good. Let's work on that and let's hope if we can do something. And he was ready to do it. But then when he goes to his people, they say, if we do, the, do it first, what would they say about us? It's still a dilemma from, for oil. Everybody thinks still that oil is necessary. In Ecuador, we are moving towards a renewable energy. We have now eight hydroelectric energy powers built. And in maybe 2020, will be 90% completely, completely alternative energy. The Galapagos Islands, which is also a conserve, and I love the Galapagos, it's a beautiful place. It's completely alternative energy, solar, hydro, and geothermal, we have a lot of mountains there. And when, so air, we have air also in some regions. So we are making it an example, but it's difficult for a developing country like Ecuador that is still is developing to just completely say we cannot, we don't want to take the oil out when others are doing it. In fact, in Peru, it's our border with Peru in the south. The Yasuni, it's in the eastern south, south. So it's with borders with Peru. Peru is taking our oil already. Like here, I think I'm sure they are taking it with the oil you found in the, in the Mediterranean. I'm sure they are taking it from another place, <laughs> from Israel. From Israel. <laughs> from Israel, I'm sure. So the same thing was happening from the side of Peru. If we are not united together to, to face this, it's difficult to happen. We have to unite. And it's you, the young generation, that are going to make it. Yeah. Well, there were so many. I mean, even Leonardo DiCaprio he was, was sending messages to everybody to not to let it happen. And all the actors, the United, but maybe, I don't know, you have to go into a specific, uh, I don't know, <laughs> group, age, a group, yeah. So it was, we, we tried, we tried. But as I said, I cannot make it because it's internally in Ecuador, it's going against the decision that was made. So it's up to you if you can still put it as an example. By the word, the, the, I told you that the word um, Yasuni means sacred land. And the indigenous are still moving. Uh, indigenous communities all over, they are uniting to, to, to do something too. 
Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Sukhan, Dr. Saliba, and Dr. Hajian, and then we move back. Oh, you've got the mic already. Very, very quick. Dr. Sukhan, and then, yes. and then we move down. I'm just uh, worried about this area. Is it well mapped in terms of fauna and flora? It's what? Is it well mapped? Are all the fauna and flora classified in this area? Yeah, they are. They are. If you can enter, you have the four groups. It's the only place. If you go to the maps and you see the red stop spots, there are only five places in the world that have the four groups like we have in the Yasuni. So you have, you have the list of all the fauna and flora because you've mentioned now that we might be losing a species that can break no, no. down plastic. We have everything. If you go into the uh, specific uh, place, uh, place in the internet... Yeah, and what about... Wait, Faisal knows more about it. Okay. So they're not mapped yet. So this is not known. I thought that they are. That no, no. We didn't mention it here. I know there are so many that are not yeah. known. So, so it's going to be a great loss. And I would like to tell you that in Lebanon, we're about to lose a similar site in Jenny because they're about to build a dam there. Oh, my it's God. It's a sacred valley as well. Ah. Thank you. No, the, every day we discover new species here. That's what I'm saying. So ah. this is going to happen before we even have the chance to map everything Absolutely. in terms of fauna and flora. And then from there on, we're not going to know what kind of species we're losing. You're right. So I'm so sorry. Yes. Two very quick ones. Uh, first, uh, thank you so much for this interesting presentation. I'm from UNDP, and I'm serving an oil-producing country, so I do share your worries and concerns. I just wanted to see uh, whether you've also explored, uh, you know, hosting the international community on that side for some conference of the parties. Climate summit recently has been done in New York. Maybe you can build on that momentum to shift that you know, attention uh, further, more at the policy and the political level. Mm -hmm. It would be also interesting to see what, what are the, 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 the plans to adapt to this new reality? How, are you, how is the government of Ecuador dealing with new, this new reality to, to conserve what is left, the indigenous people, the life of the people, the biodiversity, and what have you? Thanks. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the Constitution of Ecuador, of the 2008 Constitution, it's the first one that gives rights to, 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 to the earth. It's called it the Pachamama. And um, it's because of, I told you, they believe in it. And in fact, um, they are doing a lot. We have in Ecuador, Ecuador is 250,000 square kilometers, and we have 44 protected areas. More than 22% of the land is protected. So they can, it can't be touched in places. In one of them is the Yasuni. It shouldn't be touched. It has to be passed in Congress and proved to be able to do it. But the conditions were that they will not affect the areas that this indigenous on voluntary isolation communities live. So there is a group of people that, have, that are following it up, that are looking at it, that are seeing how they do it. Um, that the roads shouldn't be done, if ever, because they are saying that they will do it without roads, in the parts, just to make it in a, like, senderos, they call it, that it's not a certain amount of, uh, of trees cannot be touched, so very little. Um, the, the oil has to be done in a way that, uh, from a branch, like you make one hole and it goes underneath to the, to the rest if they want to take it out, and then they will not do pipelines. So, so it's, it's being very well studied, and it's taking a lot um, it's taking a long time to, to take, until now they cannot do it. They said that they will take the oil in six months since it started, and it, now it's been a year and they can't still do it because it's very expensive. Uh, the technology has to be the best technology. It's difficult to do it without having the studies and the permits. The Ministry of Environment is taking very much um, care of that, that they, all the permits are there. We are very strict in all levels, not only for the Yasuni, for everything in Ecuador. If you want to cut a tree in Ecuador, you cannot do it, especially if it's a tree that it's a specific tree that has more than several, certain amount of years. There is a project that my son wanted to do, and, and it's a land where there's not protected, and still to cut the trees, it's a, it's a, it's a big, it's very difficult. You have to, 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 to uh, um, reforest in another place, and, and if this tree is, is old uh, enough, it cannot be cut. So we, are, we have a lot of restrictions for the environment uh, in Ecuador. It's been th that for a long time, especially with this government. But what, when you mention other places that we are uniting in the United Nations, this year when there was the General Assembly in the United Nations, because we were supposed to be present, presenting, there was a lot of talk about it. 
uh, with the climate change groups, um, the climate heroes group, um, as I said, the, 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 the Clinton Global Initiative. So there are a lot of NGOs that care for it. At the UNDP, it's amazing how much they care. In fact, himself, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, he was the first one to say, please don't touch the Yasuni. So it was sad, it was maybe not, not the right moment to do it, but we couldn't wait longer because of the, of the push of the oil people that the needs of money for other things was that, and that it was not um, good to continue making it more known, it was going out of hand. It was going out of hand. Hi, I want to thank you because you did not make it glorious. You, you talked about it the way it is, and this is what we need because we know that it's a struggle to do environmental work or to protect the environment. So really, thank you for this. For the many talks that I listened to, this is probably the first one that presents the reality the way it is. Uh, so this is uh, the first question. And the second thing uh, you said, and it's really bold, that you said, we are leaving. Yani, if we keep doing what we're doing, we might not exist, but the nature is going to exist. And this is very important to understand. So my question is, it's a little bit philosophical, so should we continue? I mean, somebody asked, what are the lessons learned? Is it worth it? Should we do it? And how? I think yes. First of all, thank you for what you said, for your words. And uh, should we continue? Yes. In fact, I have retired. This is the first time I speak after it was finished. I never gave an interview. I didn't accept to talk with anybody after that because I was very much affected. It affected me a lot, especially from my grandchildren. Um, my granddaughter, she's only five years old, six now. She was crying every day. And she was telling me, Bonnie, she calls me Bonnie. How can you accept? You tell the president that I'm going to go and, 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 and hit him because of this. I mean, you cannot believe how the children are, are, were affected for it, and even until now. So I, 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 I completely shut myself. I didn't want to give any talk because they were following to know what. Um, if we have to continue, yes. Yes. The present and the future generations, they need us mothers to, 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 it's Mother Earth, they call it. We are the ones that know the, the importance. I'm not talking about against men, <laughs> on the contrary. I'm just saying that we know the value of the human. I don't think a mother will kill her son with a gun <laughs> or her children, because for, for me, all children are our sons and daughters. So we have to do something. And the young generations are the ones that are asking for it. The policy makers are not doing it. That's the problem. The problem is that they just put a blank. And you know why? All it's about money, 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 money. We are living in a capitalist, capitalistic world that the only thing they care about is how much we're going to get and how much we're going to have. And it's because of all this media think in that, thinking that it's about what is success, it's accumulation of money. So we are becoming a plastic society, pushing a button, we forgot about our values. We don't care about anything. What are we building? Robots? So this is what we have to start thinking. Are we doing it the right way? Or maybe we do that because we don't want to think of the dangers. And the easiest way is not to think. But if we sit and, and, and be realistic, we are living in a very dangerous moment, more wars than ever more diseases than ever. Economic crisis because of more, 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 more of the few and less, less, less of the, of the those that don't have. I mean, you have to create a, a strong middle class. And, and it's not happening, not even in the United States. So what is happening with the climate? One of the reasons that in the Constitution, because they gave the rights of, of, of the earth, is because the earth doesn't talk. 
it's a silent movement. I said, no, it talks a lot because the reactions that it's happening and it's happening, the melting of the snow, the, 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 the tsunamis, the disaster, it's a shout of the earth, please do something. We have been, I'm giving you so much. What we are is because of the earth. And we're not doing anything to save it. I mean, there is, a, there is a moment that we have to reflect that we don't have to just campaign to get to be president and to get to be the position and to get to have this position and how to keep the position. This is what's happening in this world now. They get to power and they think that if they lose it, they lose. So in order not to lose, they do anything not to lose. And we are losing everything because of that. So we have to start being a little more reflective why we are here, what do we want, what is the purpose of us in this moment where we are. And I think the Middle East is a very important area to start. I think that's why they are dividing us so much. And I'm talking as a Lebanese now. And nobody's realizing that we are being used because we have so much wealth. Because this is a power that we have here. Imagine when King Faisal of Saudi Arabia stopped the oil for one week, what happened to the world? Okay, he was killed. But we're still more divided than ever. And nobody reflects. I come to Lebanon, that's why I don't come and stay longer, because all the conversations are about the same thing. They talk and talk and talk and talk and say, so what is to be done? We cannot do anything. Okay, Doctor, we've got Dr. Hachian, Dr. Ertas, an important family member, and then back there. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, who the enemy is? Excellency, thank you so much for a lovely presentation. Actually, we are doing things. We have some success stories where we have managed to block greed eating out from Mother Earth. But obviously, you have also so many failures. But you stopped at the point where you said people want to get to positions and they want to maintain these positions and never leave them. In your personal experience, there were so many forces leading this initiative to success or to marginal failures. How much do you think was the role of the president of Ecuador and how much was he a force to move this initiative in the right direction? From a perspective, uh, as um, the famous writer who has written the history of political order, Okuyama says, it's all about the good emperor and the bad emperor. If you happen to have a good emperor in place, things will move in the right direction. How much, from your experience, is the value added of your president in Ecuador in leading this and doing all what is being done? And my second question, this is a pure environmental issue. Why was it done with UNDP, not UNEP? <laughs> That's a very good, a very good question, uh, Boris. Um, I believed in the president when I took the position. I believed in him. He wanted it to be successful. He wanted it. I don't know if he was surrounded with the right people, the right people. And sometimes when you are in power, you, you are isolated, you know, you are in the position and they don't let the people that could change or could make him realize that what he was, his, was, was about to be doing was wrong. I had a meeting with him before, of course. We had a meeting and, and everything was supposed to be waiting until 2014, until we will see more clear what was going on. But there was the emergency of the other group that were pushing, pushing, and they wouldn't let anybody in. So he was very sad. In fact, when he was taking the decision, it took him a few days, closed himself, wouldn't do it. He made a national television statement, and he almost cried when he was talking. I mean, he was very touched. He said, my most difficult decision ever, not only the presidency, but ever in life, has been this one. And I don't want to do it. And I wish I could still not do it. In fact, a few months ago, he asked me if I could still meet with some people in New York. The N, <laughs> who said, who asked about the UNEP? No, yes. To meet with some people there and to meet also with Jeffrey Sachs, who has the Earth Institute. And I went there. And we tried. 
because he said, if we can still do something, I will go back. Those, all the people around him, those that don't want, were so mad. I mean, we can't, you cannot. They will call me and say, Yvonne, please, you affect the president so much, don't let this happen. You are going to destroy the country. Because, uh, yes, so it's personal, personal interests. So we met with Jeffrey Sachs, and in fact, with all the group also for the environmental people also at the UN. Um, and, um, and he said, it is, it is, it's possible, let's try. He tried, he tried to get people to see if we can get at least one billion of, you know, it, it was, it's not easy. The economic crisis is one point, but also the goal, the, those groups that they don't want this to be yet a precedent. I don't understand this president as a bad president, but this is the reality. Even those groups, I mean, those that they want, I'm sure the environmental people and the environmental groups and the, those that believe that this is the right moment, they think that maybe it's not yet the right moment. It could be. Ian? Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for this organizing talk. But about a year or so ago, somebody by the name of Annabelle Ford from the University of California gave a talk in the museum here at the UB. And she provided lots of evidence that these forests, I mean, she was working in the rainforests in Belize and mm -hmm. Guatemala, and I mean, it's the same extension, have survived thousands and thousands of years, almost the same through cycling the landscape to maintain, that is, a steady state of repletion versus depletion. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, she then showed us other landscapes where either man interfered or others, where resources were taken that the landscape basically it served its purpose for a finite time and died. You mentioned about using alternative energies and using resources from these forests uh, which are repletable so that you will learn from the forest's history to maintain the earth. How much research funding and how much research is there that would look into these alternatives in a very serious manner to ultimately, hopefully, counter the argument that an easily obtainable uh, energy source is the best way to go for. Mm -hmm. So what you, you're meaning is the, the, the research on what we have over the land, over, over the earth, not about the research, the, the, the oil and the Then drug. the forest, not the oil. The I mean, the Thing, alternatives. Yeah. I mean, you the, mentioned drugs, but there are others. I mean, you could, yeah. you could get, uh, you can, get fermentations and alcohol production. You can get whatever. Many, many things, I mean, no, known no. and unknown. How much research, the question is, how much funding for research into looking into these forests for uh, repletable energy sources? We have, we, have, we have a lot of funds for research. We got a lot of funds for research from Australia, especially, and from, from other countries, from the issues of research, from Canada also. But the thing is that this area, as I said, is very isolated. You can't go inside there. So it's difficult to find what we have. The question that was mentioned, you have so many things there that you have never been found, because we can't go in. It's difficult to go in on places that are dangerous. In fact, there were many people being killed because of entering in those areas. And when the oil fields started in nearby areas, Communities were killed because of that. And so it, so it's, it's not easy to go inside. We have been doing a lot of research now uh, on the surroundings of it. And we know that there is by far more, by far more that we, we can't know yet. But um, in the issues of research for alternative energy, this is not there. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you cannot, for example, you are so talking about to put, uh, to, 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 to have, uh, kinds of plants that you convert into energy. This is, this is other lands. You can't do that on the, on the Amazon. You cannot uh, plant there. I mean, it's, it will destroy what we have. 
or energy? Not energy or any other to, to, to get any, to tell the countries that, okay, you have so much money coming out of oil, you will have so much money given to you from uh -huh. coming out of this alternative sources. You know what, you're mentioning something that I think I didn't mention. You know what the president always said also, I think it's important, it's, it's, he said something. He said if the Amazon would have been in the West, their countries, long time ago they would have made us paid for the uh, oxygen that we were giving. So, but oxygen cannot be measured. So yeah, we are selling oxygen. What we were selling, it was not electricity or energy, it's oxygen, which is what's mostly needed. Clean oxygen, but you, you can't put a price. I mean, there should be a price for oxygen. There should be something that would be measurable of what this primary forest, because reforestation doesn't give the oxygen, but primary forests are the ones that are be able to, especially in the Amazon, tropical places. Um, so, so yeah, but that's what we were trying to explain to the world. Let's put a price for the oxygen and we will keep the oil underground because this that we're giving to humanity is, it has a price. They wouldn't accept that. It's not measurable. I asked, I had a meeting once with, um, with um, the other pri uh, economic uh, uh, win uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, what's his name, um, Stiglitz, Joseph Stiglitz, who had made a study also of the economic part, the economic part of, the, of, the, of what we have there in, in, in the air. And he told me, he told me it would be great if we can measure the price of oxygen one day. Because the most amount of money will come from our places in the world. I mean, that uh, it's clean, that they are giving it to the world. That's why we said it's a gift to humanity, because they are the lungs to the world. And that's why Vandana Shiva also, she's very well known, Vandana Shiva, she's a scientist, um, an environmentalist. And Al Gore, he said, what's going, to, what's going to regulate climate change is if we can save the Amazon because of the oxygen. So how can you measure it? That's the problem. If, uh... We have one more question, two, I'll go for two. But it's, uh, what you're saying here is the hypocrisy of Western societies and governments and culture where things are allowable in one part of the world and they're not. And if the Amazon were a bank, it would have been saved a long time ago. Somebody said that, really, exactly. Yeah. If, if, I think Al Gore said that. If the Amazon was a bank, it would have been saved a long, saved long, a long time ago. Exactly. We've got two, two last questions in the back. And, okay, we'll just go with Dr. Habib because I cannot say no to her. <laughs> three questions, that's done. One, two, three, please. You start, please. As a suggestion, is it possible to uh, replicate Yasun so to preserve the vegetation? And to, to, dupl to, dupl to duplicate it, yes. Replicate it in another replicate place? It. Replicate it. Uh, replicate? I mean, yes. whatever is possible since you're able to uh, collect some budget for it. Yeah, and yeah. It will be uh, it will be in return to the uh, exploited land that will be used for all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes samples of the vegetation and everything, and then duplicate it. Yeah, so that it will uh, will not lose the it, it, oral it's flora, uh, the it is, flora it, and the. Fauna. It is difficult. It is difficult to replicate it uh, because it's so unique. But you know, other countries like Colombia, they are trying to do something similar in an area in Colombia that maybe it has less oil, but it still has oil, and yeah. it's, 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 very, it's very known to be uh, with a high biodiversity. Yeah. The only thing is that in all the Amazon of all the countries, something like the Yasuni, it's, it's not replicated, it's, it's different. But the idea could be replicated as an idea of following it up for the future, um, that, uh, that, that, that uh, we can conserve oil and at the same time be able to get money out of the oxygen and out of the biodiversity in medicine, scientific development. Uh, and you will be exploiting it. Yes. And they, and you, anyway, on, on, other, on both sides, you will be exploiting it. Either it's from, uh, used to all, uh, for all industry or use it for pharmaceutical uh, purposes. Yeah. And then you're speaking that uh, you want to conserve it and, and protect the land. They're going to do that. In fact, I said that you will make uh, an area that's larger for Yasuni, you know, and then let uh, others exploit uh, the land in case they want to take uh, oil from it. Mm -hmm. I mean, on both sides, you're depleting it. Yes. And it should be virgin and untouched. Uh huh. No? No, you agree? I agree. So it's better to take some species from, uh, from the uh, Yasuni and protect it and, and, uh, and, and duplicate it. Yeah, 
I agree. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Those, those I don't know. Uh, thank you for coming so far to uh, promote this project, which uh, unfortunately didn't work. Uh, regarding the setback, uh, I was wondering what is the reason that pushed the Korea's uh, administration to withdraw from the initiative? Is it because like corporations were pushing? to drill oil, or is it like nationalized uh, drill uh, drilling uh, fields? So is it the, the administration that is going to profit from this extraction, or is it corporations that, like with former administration, had signed contract, which have forced Korea's administration to push for drilling? You are putting me in a very difficult situation to answer, but um, I will say it without hope <laughs> not being published. <laughs> I have to say it because I really, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. He, he, wa he was pushed. He was pushed, as I said, because of the needs that we had and because there was, there is a place in the southern part of the Amazon that there is also oil and they were supposed to take from there the oil, but they found out that it was not as much and it was not, um, um, it couldn't happen. It failed. And uh, so they decided a country that you will know that also haven't signed the Kyoto and that is uh, taking oil everywhere from the world now because of their development, <laughs> I will not mention, <laughs> was needing, was, uh, was, uh, was uh, wanting that, that, uh, that oil. And it was putting a very, very, very high price that was difficult for say no. As I told you, they found that there's by far more oil underneath. Though it's a very heavy crude, heavy oil, that needs a lot of... Um, um, Refining. Yeah. You, you put more water and uh, being... So it's more difficult to take out, and it contaminates more, because you have to push more water inside. It's still, they, they, it, is, it, it was very much needed. And they wanted, they, wanted, they wanted to do that. And that was the condition for them to give all the money and more than what we were asking. So, I said it. <laughs> okay, I, I'll, I'll ask my question. That's the last question, I suppose. Yes. Thank you so much for, say, for sharing your experience with us. We appreciate it a lot. And I'm not really surprised that the international community and the countries that you have approached haven't pitched in to help because how can you ask the culprit to help the victim? However, I will go back to the Ecuadorians themselves and I ask them if they have survived for so long without touching the Yasuni, without extracting the oil from under the ground. Why can't they do that again? Why can't they keep on doing it again? I will tell you, that's a good question too, because that's why I'm telling you this government is a very ex excellent government. We haven't had a government like this one in Ecuador since a long time. The president of Ecuador, Correa, has done so much that nobody else before had done. In fact, we had two former presidents of Ecuador that were from Lebanese origin, two of them. But there was, in Ecuador, there was a lot of corruption, not from them, I'm talking about in general. <laughs> Um, and they have changed governments many times. We had 10 presidents in 10 years or eight years, 10. So he came with amazing ideas of change that was in fact, when I was running for president, that was my, what I was doing was mostly that, fight corruption, generate a, a stronger middle class, generate jobs, um, you know, um, have pride to be Ecuadorian of what we have because it's an amazing country, uh, create infrastructure so we can make it a, a touristic attraction number one. Um, all the things he, he believes in it are amazing. I mean, he, he came with a fantastic agenda and he was implementing it, but it costs money. So he did, now we have the best infrastructure in the region after Chile. The roads, the, the high, highways. We have the school system. It was a political group that was killing the education, education in Ecuador. He put it out. And now education is free for everyone. They have the best schools are the public schools. He's doing universities that are amazing and they are an example. The one that he's doing now in the Amazon is for research of what the Amazon has. 
Um, if you go to hospitals, now the system is amazing. We have universal health and uh, the, the people are, can get, um, name it. I mean, he is revolutionary in change, in positive change. So that's why he needs the money. I mean, it's not because he needs it to, 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 to what they did before, <laughs> but to invest it in the people and to save. There was a big gap in Ecuador. Those that have were very, very, very few, and those that didn't have were very, very, very poor, and there was a kind like a slavery for the people, especially the indigenous, that was not accepted in Ecuador. And that's why they were changing the, the presidents all the time. This one is different. And that I have to acknowledge that that's what the end. So what he's de doing is fantastic. And that's why it was impossible for me to keep pushing to continue with the project, knowing that the money was needed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we've got this, a good person yes. that wants to say, we can then close down. Yes. That's an important that. person, I think. Well, I know very much if you want. Uh, to save the environment of Lebanon, I think you have to be the Minister of Environment to work with the General Manager so that you will make miracles. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, and especially Your Excellency. It's been a, an enlightening hour and a half that felt like less than half an hour oh, I'm so happy to be here. and uh, we hope to have you more amongst us uh, if we could and the Isam Ferris Institute team is will be in Peru so will you be there I'm coming and we would as like as to have you uh, visit our side event of course what, what day are you I'm December 6 we have our side event for all that don't know we have a side event that we're organizing with the help from the Ministry of Environment and uh, Sao Paulo University, and we would love to have you amongst us again there. Let, let me see if I can stay until this. I have to leave. I'm going to a special event that it's before, yes. so I have to leave on the third. I have to be in Washington. But if I can, if I can, I will promise Excellent. I will be there for thank sure. Thank you so it's much for everything. For me and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.